Good evening, and welcome to Hearing the Voice of God. Oh, I said evening. Yeah, I never say evening. I always say morning. Yeah, that is uh, an unusual thing. Yes, it is. Oh, no. Mr. Screen, I just checked you before service. Uh, uh, Mr. S Mr. Button doesn't want to work. Okay, why does Mr. Button not want to work? Just exercise. Okay. Uh, okay, well, I will go up there and see if I can. If you're online, I'll be back down in a second. You see my little head bobbing down. I, I, last week we had this problem in the evening, and I, I, I came early at night and tested it out. Everything was working perfectly. Was. Of course. Well, we can always pray. Dear Lord, we ask you this to bless this evening, Lord. Bless all we're doing today, Lord, so we can have a great time learning how to hear your voice. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. I'm to the top of the screen. All right, let's see. Oh, that's not good. Ah, I know why it's not working. Mr. Computer has decided to shut down. Aha. Yeah. All right, we'll fix that in a second. We kind of need the screens to go over our things from last week, because I don't have them memorized. Oh, yeah, yeah, I know. You, you... You, 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 all, you all think like I know everything. Yes, I know. Uh, just give me a second. Technical difficulties. All right. Coming early to make everything work great. And then, okay. Try one more time here. All right. There we go. Mr. Computer's coming back up. Yes, you shut down. I realize that. You did that to me. Yes. I understand. Slideshow. You're all laughing at me. That's okay. You're laughing with me. All right. Here we go. All right. Hearing God's voice tonight. So uh, last week we picked up on, uh, we're in lesson nine. This is lesson nine, uh, number two, uh, because it's a long lesson. And le next week is we start lesson 10. I hope to get lesson 10 done in two weeks. Uh, and finish up on February the 7th, but no guarantees on that, and we'll see how it goes. All right, so now that Mr. Clicker is going, here we go. Last week we asked you to read these verses, Philippians 4, 6 through 9. And how can you apply these verses to help you make, to, to help your life today to make it what? Better, isn't that? You know, if we're going to hear from God's voice, he's gonna, we're going to hear from his voice so our life is miserable, right? I hope not. I mean, if that's why you want to hear God's voice. Now, believe it or not, there are some people that just, just want to be miserable. I don't know why. Now, will there be miserable times? Absolutely. Paul talks about it. I was reading this week about his life uh, in my devotions, and it can't do a part talking about how he was beaten in all these times, a minus a 40 minus 1. He was put in prison. He was mocked. He was left for dead. Paul went through some amazing things. But you know what? He always kept his eyes on the Lord because he knew no matter what happened to him on this planet, he knew that Jesus was better because he had the experience of God. He talked to God. And he knew that, hey, and he's the one who wrote our verse from this morning. What? To, anybody remember? Philippians 121? To live is Christ, but to die is gain. All right, somebody pay attention. All right. So that wasn't a Hebrews verse this morning. And, uh, uh, this morning, I do get to, uh, I, I feel bad for Cindy Ryder, she's watching tonight. She turned in her, her list. She got, you know how we did 2, 3, maybe 2, 14 through 18? Well, hers, she picked 2, 12, and 13, so she just kind of missed out on that. Uh, so uh, so, so uh, I feel sorry for you, Cindy, but there's still more weeks to go for your other verses to get picked uh, if you're watching tonight. But uh, let's read through Philippians 4, 6 through 9, and then uh, we will comment on that. Okay, so how can you apply these verses to make your life better? Isn't that, that's what we want, right? We want our life to be better. So it says here, one God and Father of all, who is above all, through him and in you all things. It's glad that there's one God, right? Could you imagine if there was like 20 gods? Actually, just imagine if there were two. I mean, you got two people on the planet who try to rule everything. I mean, they, they can never get along. Imagine if there was two almighty gods. That'd be horrible. You know, you really wouldn't go anywhere. So I'm glad there's one. But to each, each one of us, grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gifts. Therefore, he says, when he ascended on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts to men. 
Now this he ascended, what does it mean? But he also first ascended to the lower parts of the earth. Oh, wait, I'm doing, I'm sorry. I'm in Ephesians, not Philippians. I'm wondering, this does not work. This doesn't work. Okay, here we go. Be anxious for nothing. Now, how does that make your life better? You know, be anxious. See, see, don't worry. I get, I'm giving you bonus verses tonight. See, see, I, I, I can turn everything into something good. Okay, all right. But you know what? So that first one, be anxious about what? Nothing. And that goes with what I was talking about Paul and his life. So that makes more sense now, doesn't it? You know, um, and uh, so, so he says, you know, we get anxious about a lot of things. God says what? Just be cool as a, cool, cool as a cucumber, right? Just re- God's got it. I mean, I never get anxious about anything. All right, if you can't hear it online, they're laughing at me. We all do, from the best of us to the least of us to all of us, we get anxious about things. But God wants to remember, you don't have to get anxious about anything. So you begin to get anxious, just say, hey, God, you said, I don't have to worry about anything. And here's the deal about anxiousness. God's not going to take it from you. You have to what? You got to let it go, Okay. Let's see, what else does it say here? But in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. I love that. We can make our requests be made known to God, right? We can make any request we want. Now, the great thing is we can make the request. doesn't mean that he has to answer it how we want it answered. Because sometimes what we want isn't what's best for us. And we'll get to that in a few minutes. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding. Isn't that great? He gives us peace so we cannot be anxious and it surpasses what? All understanding. What's that mean? Yeah, it passes our understanding. It's better than us. See, see what's the biggest problem about people coming to God? Oh, I just, I, I got to really understand it. No, if you got to totally understand God, you're never going to totally understand God because if you could ever totally understand God, he wouldn't, you'd be the God. Right? If he wasn't bigger and, and, and more than we could ever understand, he would not be God. And we'll, he will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Isn't that great? He, so, and then finally, brethren, whatever things are true, noble, just, pure, lovely, anything of good report, is anything of virtue, or is anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things, the things which you have learned and received and heard and saw in me, these do, and the God of peace will be with you. So when will the God of peace be with us to make our life better? When we think about what? Good thoughts. So when someone makes you mad, what should you think about them? Good thoughts. Do we do that? Sometimes. But here's the deal. Will you get mad at somebody? Sure. But here's the process. As a Christian, remember this morning we talked about if you want God to help you, you have to what? What was the P word? You have to... Bro, what was that word? Yeah, that's what I'm trying to get to. You have to progress, right? You can't just stay at a flat line of Christianity and expect God. See, people do, they get saved, God does things for them, and they think that's the way it'll always be. Problem is, God wants you to what? Progress. He won't continue to do things for you if you stay here. Because what's he doing? Now he's doing is enabling you and entitling you and, and not letting you grow to be the person he wants you to be in the Lord. He is a good father. Um, but he says, you know, we, we're supposed to think, we think good thoughts, the God of peace will be with us. When we think angry thoughts, the God of peace won't be with us. Why? Because he's the God of peace. Now, does God get angry? Yeah. Does God do things? But his judgment is always right, isn't it? When he does something in the Bible, he does it and he has a good reason for it. We might not understand it right now. One day in heaven we'll understand it, but he's always right. When we get mad, are we always right? <laughs> I got laughter on that one. No, we're not, are we? Because sometimes someone makes us mad, but they said something to us that we really need to hear. We just didn't want to hear it, but we get mad back at them and it doesn't really help us out. You know, hearing, we got, we got to listen to what people say. And God says, if you think about good thought, think about whatever is pure, noble, a good report, praiseworthy, excellent, what are you going to be doing? You're actually going to be, what are you actually going to be doing? To think about those things takes what? Effort, right? You also got to listen to the other person and try to find when someone's yelling at your face the good, noble, love, praise, worthy thing, right? But you know what? It's an exercise. And it's to teach us how to do that in what? Real life. We need to learn how to do that. So, so these things will make your life better because when you, you know, sometimes you get mad at somebody, right? 
And you feel good about being mad at that person for that time period, right? Because that's, yeah, that's who we are. Oh, don't shake your head. Yeah, when you get mad at somebody, you kind of feel good about it. But what happens? But then later on, what? You, you regret it. Or something, you do something that doesn't fix the situation. Or, the situa- or you get mad back, they get mad back, and they get mad back, and you get, what happens? It's just a continual cycle. God says, you want to have peace, break the cycle and let me defend you. Because he says, what's he say after he says that, that, that if you do that? He says what? And the God of peace will guard your heart. Because really that's what gets affected, right? We don't really care what happens to us out here, but we do care when it gets inside of us, right? That's what he's talking about the heart. He's not talking about the pumpy thing. He's talking about our, our, our ego, our, our um, <clears throat> inside, our soul, uh, we, 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 our reputation. We, we, we want to protect that above all else. You know what? Either we can protect it or what? God can protect it. And if God's doing it, because if we're trying to protect it, we, we get nervous, we get anxious, we get stressed out. All those things lead to bad things. God says, don't stress out about it. Let me stress out about it. But God never stresses out. He already knows the answer and how to take care of it. The problem is he won't take care of it unless you what? Ask him to and allow him to and or well, sort of but force yourself to think what? About what is good and no. See, see, here's the process. You know, people go, well, I ask. I, obey, I, I listen to what God says. But then you got to actually what? Do what God says. See, that, that third part is the, is the hard part. Because you see, God wants to know if we're actually listening, right? I mean, I mean hearing the voice. If we can't listen to what we read, what we have actually in front of us, how are we going to listen when God actually speaks his own voice to us? How are we going to feel that out? All right, let's go on to the next one. Uh, the next reflection from last week. Can you reflect on a time where the devil tried to do something in your life that you actually ended up furthering God's plan in your life? Anybody, have an, anybody write down an answer in their book for that? You never had a time where something went wrong and, but it actually turned out good? Mm. It messes with you. But you can use, you know, it's a tor- terrible experience. A fantastic testimony. So it is good. Wow. That's amazing that to pray for someone who molested you back when you were a kid, but you now use it as a testimony to help others. You know, God never wanted it to happen to you. I mean, people do bad things. But you know what? God can guard the heart. You know, you don't feel like it at the moment, but that, that happens. Now, let's go on to the other reflection, which was, I think, the harder of the two. Can you reflect on a time that God allowed this to happen, but how could it be avoided in the first place by choices we had made? I have, done, I have gone through so many things in my lifetime where I have done things, and if I just would have made the right choice in the first place, it would have worked out so much better. I, I, I tend to worry about things way too much. Uh, yeah, don't nod your head, dear. Yes, okay, go ahead. Uh, but, you know, we do that, but then, but then we realize, you know what, you know, if I could, but sometimes, you know what God has to do, he has to knock me off my pedestal to get me to where he wants me to go. We, 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 we have a great fling, you know, he didn't fling my ear, he flinged my whole body, okay? But, you know, you know we, we get to places, and, and, and what happens is we think we know how we're going, but we get ahead of God. And then God either has to let us fall, or sometimes he has to push us off the brick altogether, because, you know, what happens when, as soon as we get down, the sooner we can get up and get back following him. You know, sometimes people go, well, well, why did God let that happen? Because you know if you kept going, you're going to kill yourself, okay? Maybe not literally, maybe your soul, maybe you might lead others away from God. Maybe what you're doing is not doing what God really wants. You're not keeping in mind what we talked about this morning, such a great salvation, right? You know, we can take that for granted. You know, like last week, the, uh, John Paul Jackson talked about Joseph, right? How he got into Egypt to fill God's plan, but if Joseph wasn't such an arrogant young boy and teased his brothers all that. Maybe God would have brought him to Egypt a different way uh, without having to go through all the troubles he went through. Why did Joseph go through all those troubles? God had to knock him down about 50 pegs. Uh, he, he had to humble him. You know, if I learned one thing in my life, it, humbleness. If you can stay humble, you'll go far with the Lord. You get ahead of the Lord and you go there, you, you could have a big ministry, but guess what? you'll fall. I mean, we've seen so, I mean, just watch the news. All, all these big time preachers end up falling and all this stuff. 
Why? Because it's my ministry. Whoa, no, no, no. Um, and uh, the, the latest one, at least in, in our movement, in the Pentecostal world, you had the guy at the Hillsong Church in New York who fell for doing, just being, just, he got a big head. It's really what, he got into, all these stars started going to his church. And then he had to keep up with the Joneses. Guess what? When you got God, you don't got to keep up with the Joneses. The Joneses got to keep up with God. Okay? <laughs> that's, the, that's the way it's supposed to be. So, th- so those are our reflections from last week. So we're going to get right into uh, this week. We're, we're backing up about three minutes. So if you got point number four, you're going to see point number four again. And then we get to five, six, seven, eight, nine, and ten. I think there's ten, right? Someone want to correct me? There's ten. Cool. Yes. All right. And uh, has some really good nuggets tonight. So here we go. We always have good nuggets. So I'm going to go down. I'm going to go up there and flip on the uh, video screen and turn the camera for everybody else. Hopefully Mr. Computer is still working. I haven't thrown it over the ledge yet. Mr. Computer and me have gotten close to that on a few days. (laughs) I think everybody has a love-hate relationship with their computer. Unfortunately for me, I have multiple computers because all the things that we do. Some days I think they talk to each other and gang up on me. No, I'm not paranoid. All right, here we go. I'm going to get the online people so they can whoop, hop in with us. There we go. Play. You laughing at me down there? Oh, you, can go, you run out to the cafe and grab a cup of coffee. If you're online, you can't run in the cafe and grab a cup of coffee. You can do one at home. All right, here we go. Make them can't just think about it. We have to do it. Take the weak and make them strong. Take the strong, make them stronger. Take the great, make them greater. James 1 23 and 20 through 25. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man observing his natural face in a mirror. For he observes himself, goes away, and immediately forgets what kind of man he saw. Some versions say what kind of man he was. Wow. Matthew 7, 24. Therefore, whoever hears these things, sayings of mine and does them, I will liken him to a wise man who built his house upon a rock. Attune yourself to what the Holy Spirit's doing. Walk in peace. Put away anxiety. Focus on the Lord. Think on these things that are pure, true, just, holy, good report, virtuous, praiseworthy. Think on these things. Everything the enemy does to us, the Lord uses to perfect us in his image. He uses them to perfect us in his image. The enemy plays into the plans of God and doesn't even know it. The enemy got Joseph to Egypt. He did not know he was doing God a favor. Now, could could Joseph have gotten to Egypt some other way? I think so. I think if Joseph wouldn't have been so haughty, he could have gotten to Egypt any number of ways. He was so smart, he could have ended up owning his own trading company and got to Egypt. And yes, Joseph had flaws, and the enemy took advantage of those flaws, but God wanted Joseph in Egypt, and he got there. Focus on the positive, not on the negative. You give power... You give power to either good or evil by focusing your thoughts and attention in that direction. What you focus on, you make room for. You focus on evil, you make room for it. You focus on God, you make room for it. You focus on the good thing God gives, you make room for it. You focus on the evil things in life, you make room for them. And what I have noticed over over my life now, I've noticed this. Similar things happen to similar people. And one, I counsel responded incredibly and are doing great. Another one that I counsel has responded terribly and doing bad. Never have I seen a person respond great and do bad. Never have I seen a person respond great to what happened and do bad. The rest of the life be bad. 
I've watched people respond great, and, and the rest of the life is great. I've watched people respond bad, and every bad response leads to another bad response, leads to another bad response, and the life is full of sorrow and wrong choices. And that's why it's important to establish these private victories because they build a history and a momentum and inertia, if you will, of, of right choices, right decisions, and momentum in God that propels you to the next right choice. Some things, are, some things are simply relating to God. Some things are relating to the ways of God. And the ways of God is making right choices. The ways of God is being attuned to his spirit. The ways of God. Moses said, teach me your ways that I might know you. And so it's too often the church has said, just know God. But they don't tell you how. Seek God, but they don't tell you how. Get peace, but they don't tell you how. So what we're trying to do here is show you ways that can peace can rule, multifaceted ways peace can rule in your life, multifaceted ways you can have a relationship with God in your life, multifaceted ways that you can draw close to God practically, which is observance of the ways of God. The ways of God are practical in the ways. Does that make sense to you? Okay. Okay, so God desires us to develop more trust in him, which in turn will develop greater faith and character in us. Speaking things that are not as though they were, uh, that takes faith. Luke 17, verses 5 and 6. And the apostles said to the Lord, increase our faith. Increase our faith. So how does Jesus respond? So the Lord said, if you have faith as a mustard seed, you can say to this mulberry tree, be pulled up by the roots and be planted in the sea, and it would obey you. If you had faith as the mustard seed. Now, here's the question. Did that tree come up by power, or did that tree come up by authority? How do you know? I'm testing you. How do you know? It, you're right. I'll give you that hint to comfort you. You're right. Authority. How do you know? Because of one four-letter word. Nope. Begins with an O. Obey. Yes. Every time you see the word obey, it involves authority, not power. Jesus spoke to the wind and the waves, and the disciples said, what kind of man is this? Even the wind and the waves obey him. The centurion soldier saw Jesus, and he saw him doing some things, signs and wonders, and he, and he says, would you come heal my servant? And Jesus said, I will go and heal your servant. The centurion soldier said, wait a minute, I'm a man under, yes, not power, I'm a man under authority. And I say to this one, go do it, and he does. I say to my servant, come here and bring me that, and he brings it. This is an authority issue here. Speak it, and it happens. See, we think, and this is where Satan sometimes tricks us, because he, he makes us misthink the word of God. We think that tree was removed by power, and it was removed by authority. And authority, interestingly enough, that when the centurion said, said uh, Jesus marveled and said, I've never seen such faith in all of Israel. That word faith right there, one of the meanings of it is understanding the system. I've never seen such understanding of the system in all of Israel. See, if you understand the system of God, what is the system of God? The ways of God. As you understand the ways of God, your faith cannot help but increase. Understanding the ways of God is essential. It's essential. It will generate faith in you. And that faith then allows the authority God's given you to cause a mulberry tree to obey you. We think it's power. And as long as we think it's power, we will be misdirected in our faith and disappointed that it might even cause lessening faith, our faith to weaken. Because if we say to the mulberry tree, be removed, and it's not. Be removed, and it's not. Be removed, 
And it's not because we think it's power. Not understanding the system, it's authority. Authority is so important, and we, we don't recognize that yet. We will be as time progresses. Okay, so faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. For by it, elders obtained a good testimony. By faith, we understand the worlds were framed by the word of God. So the things which are seen were made of things which are, which are visible. So, this whole issue of authority, this whole issue of the ways of God, this whole issue of submission, this whole issue of private victories, this whole issue of the reticular activating system, this whole issue of responding, this whole issue of submission, this whole issue of little tiny, little tiny grains of sand becoming the foundation surrounded by the concrete of the Holy Spirit, all this fits together to form an atmosphere where you can hear from God. It's so important. Here's what it will lead you. Here's what happens. Uh, faith. Uh, you ever seen anybody buy a lottery ticket? I have. I mean, I've not bought one. But I've watched people do it, standing in line, paying for the gas, etc. So um, if you would ask somebody who's buying, buying a lottery ticket, if you, you'd say, do you hope you win? They're going to look at you and go, are you nuts? Of course I hope I win. I'm spending this money. I bought 25 tickets and I'm spending, you know, 150 bucks or whatever it is. And I'm hoping I lose. Of course I hope I win. Okay. Do you expect to win? Well, no, I don't expect to win. I mean, the chances are 45 million to one that I'm going to win. But I sure hope I do. You see, that's the difference between where we are in our Christian walk. We hope God's going to do something, but we don't yet expect God to do something. Faith is where hope and expectation collide. And the result is faith. Faith is where hope and expectation collide. And if you understand the system, then you expect the system to work and you have faith that it will happen. And that generates often a strategy for how to make things work. Okay, fruit of the Spirit in all, all of this. As we mature in Christ, we're able and willing to minister and pray for the needs of others and encourage them in the Lord. If the fruit of the Holy Spirit is present in us, we would desire to minister as an expression of love and service to those people. It's not an opportunity for recognition. It's a service to help them. Or maybe put another way, it is an act of destroying the work of evil that has been done against those people. So Galatians 5, 22 and 23, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law. So the impact of what we do makes one person, a person's life better. It's loving them. It's kind to them. It's being patient with them, etc. You'll not be fruitful in other people if you do not have the seeds of the fruit of the Holy Spirit in your life. Or, said another way, if you have the fruit of the Holy Spirit active in your life, you will have faith to be fruitful in other people. Unholy roots will always produce unholy fruit. Unholy roots will always produce unholy fruit. So we need to deal with the sin of generational strongholds, mental strongholds, repent of them, break them off of our lives, and call forth God in, uh, into our godly heritage in Christ, or call forth our godly heritage in Christ. Strongholds are attitudes that keep us from embracing Christ-likeness. In other words, I want to do what I want to do. I don't want to do what he wants me to do. That's a stronghold. We think we are being Christ-like when we're not sometimes. Strongholds will keep the reticular activating system from working. Paul was convinced he was acting on God's behalf when he was executing Christians. He was not. He had a stronghold, a mental stronghold. We often think the things we think, those things we feel are from God, only to find out later that God wasn't in them at all. That's a stronghold. 
A stronghold is a system or way of thinking rooted in a lie that we have come to believe or accept is the truth. Strongholds result in a twisting of Scripture to conform to self-serving purposes. Every person, every family, every culture, every group, every church, every organization has strongholds. James 3.16, for where envy, self-seeking exist, confusion, and every evil thing are there. Ooh. Our thought life needs to be submitted to God's control. 2 Corinthians 10, 4 and 5. This is what I mentioned this earlier. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds, casting down arguments, and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. In the original language, the Greek, it indicates to pull down strongholds means to demolish something with violence. Pull down doesn't mean just to address them. It means to demolish them aggressively with violence. Matthew 12, uh, 11, 12. The kingdom of God suffers violence. We have to pull them down with violence. And the violent take it by force. So, yes, evil may perpetrate violence against us, but we have to have a response of violence back, meaning not violence like we go out and shoot people, but an aggressive attitude that says, I will not allow this to exist in me anymore. No wonder Jesus said the kingdom of heaven is within you. It starts within you. It isn't by observation, but it starts, it starts within you. In, the, in the, uh, the biblical Greek, the word for stronghold means a castle or fortress from which one argues over one's possessions. A stronghold or fortress from which one argues over one's possessions. So you're pulling down strongholds or things that you want to keep, you don't want to let go of. You argue over what you think is yours, such as your opinion. And it's actually a form of pride. We are to cast down arguments, thoughts, vain imaginations, which basically means we are to cast down the computations of the mind. Strongholds form opinions. Opinions stifle revelation. An opinion left unaddressed will become a stronghold. Your mind needs to be renewed by the Spirit, and we have to take our thoughts captive. How do we destroy ungodly strongholds in our lives then? We must pray and ask God to reveal strongholds to us, the ones we have, and then remove them from us. For Psalms 11, 7. For God is righteous. He loves righteousness. His countenance upholds the upright. You make a conscious decision to change and ask God to help you form new thoughts that lead you to your destiny. So you ask God, I know I have a stronghold in my mind. How does this work? And he says, well, you start by doing the following things. You've, uh, Albert Einstein said this. You're familiar with this quote, I'm sure. It says, to do the same thing over and over again, expecting a different result each time is insanity. To do the same thing and expect a different result. Okay, on the positive side, a godly habit builds character and integrity, particularly if we have a habit of exercising in, ter in integrity over our own, uh, our own choices. Meaning I could make this choice, but that's not, that's not the right thing to do. So we make the integrous choice even to our own detriment. So we sow a thought we reap an action, we sow an action, we reap a habit, we sow a habit, we reap character, we sow character, we reap a destiny. I'm not sure who said that, but it's good. And it's accurate. Godly character forms our destiny. Romans 5, 3, and 4. And not only that, but we also glory in tribulations, knowing that tribulation produces perseverance, and perseverance, character, and character produces hope.
I'm going to do what I did last week. I'm going to start out with our homework because I still have the screen for those online there. So you guys, let's start with the homework and then we'll discuss what we just heard. So our homework for this week, these are our passages we want to read. Hebrews 5, 1 through 14. 1 Corinthians 2, 11 to 14. And Ephesians 4, 20 to 24. That's our reading assignments for this week. And I'll give when you... Uh, Got it written down, let me know, and I will move on. Just raise your hands. If you're online, I'm going to move for those in the audience. So hopefully you're writing down uh, right now as we have it on the screen for you. Everybody ready? All right, and our reflections for this week. Do you have a favorite scripture verse that instantly puts you in a better mood? So uh, I think this one's really neat. I think everybody needs to have this. Because you know what? If you have a verse that puts you in instantly in a better mood, you, you, you should, that, that's just something you should always have with you at all times. Because if it instantly puts you in a better mood, that means every time you're in a bad mood, you can use it. I'd be curious to see what you all come back with next week on that one. One more time. Do you have a favorite scripture verse that instantly puts you in a better mood? Everyone ready? Yes, no, maybe so? Okay. Our second reflection for the week is, <laughs> where is it? should be everywhere. So once you find that verse, you need to write it down, place where you see it, where you wake up, at work, wherever it should be. It should be everywhere. Because if it instantly puts you in a better mood, you should be in a highly what? Visible place. So your challenge this week is once you find that verse, put it in as many places as you can. Because we all have things that put us in a bad mood, whether it's a coworker or family member, something that happened, we stub your toe in the middle of the night, go into the bathroom. Hey, you want to be in a better mood? Think, think about that verse. It always puts you in a better mood. Not 100% sure if it applies to the toe being stubbed in the middle of the night, but you get my drift. And then our, and then, uh, oops. Yeah, and no more. And do you remember an occasion... When you felt God was asking you to do something, but you let the moment pass. I just said, no, th th this happens to everybody. You know, we, we feel God wants to do something, but then we don't do it and the moment passes. It's, it, 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 it's not a bad thing, but it's recognizing when you're hearing God's voice to act, to get you to prompt you to do something. You know, God wants us to be a people of action, so he's going to prompt us. But here's the great thing. If you miss it, he's going to, as long as you want to still be used by him, he'll come back again and again and again. He never gives up on you. Um, but learning those moments in time, I know I've had moments in times where that has happened that I'll share next week. But once again, do you remember an occasion when you felt God was asking you to do something, but you let the moment pass? And like I said, don't, don't look at this as a negative thing. It's a learning thing, learning how to know when it's God and when it's not. Usually we let it pass because we're wondering, was it God or not? Oops. And then we come to our meditation verse for the week. I forgot that last week, just so you know. Some, some people were asking me, what, what was the verse you're supposed to memorize? Oops, I forgot to put that on the screens last week. But this week's verse is John 14, 26. That's our, the verse you want to memorize this week. Every day, think about that verse. John 14, 26. All good? I can leave that last one on the screen as I come back out and then move the screen into the middle. And I'm on my way down, and we can talk about tonight's lesson. I think there are some really good nuggets in it. I was also, I was kind of tempted maybe just do it in two sets. But uh, at some point, I'd like to, I have other things I want to teach besides hearing the voice of God. This is class number 15. And it's been, I think it's been a good class. Have you all enjoyed it? Oh, yes. Very good. So, all right. And I'm, I'm looking at a couple new classes for uh, after Valentine's Day to start uh, up a new session. Uh, I like things like this. I think people get a lot out of it. This time I'll have the paperwork at the beginning rather than just let you guys figure out what's on there going from there. All right, so I learned too. So before I, I, I mention what I found was interesting in the lesson, and if you have anything you thought was very interesting in today's lesson. It, 
Opinion stifle revelation. That's a great thing. Why, why, why do you think, what, what do you think he means by that? Ah. Very good. Opinion is your preconceived idea about the subject. Revelation is something that's new, that's revealed to you. That's why it's called revelation. It's revealed to you. Now, now, now we've got, we got to balance that a little bit. Because God says we can come to him, right? We're supposed to come to him boldly. We're allowed to tell him what's on our mind. So can we have opinions? Absolutely. But, but you've got to be willing to listen to what he has said. But you actually, you've got to be willing to... Another thing. You can come in with an opinion... But see, why it stifles, why opinion stifle? If you come in with an opinion, but you're not willing to listen to the other side that might change your opinion, that's what stifles revelation. Because if you come in with your mind already made up, of course you're not going to hear God. And, and, and that's what holds back a lot of Christians. They come in with their opinion on what is right. The great thing is, you might be right and you might be dead wrong. See, we're humans. We look at things and then God says, no, 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 you're looking at it from the wrong point of view. But if you cannot allow, you're allowed to come in with, God wants you to come and have free thought. He wants you to think. He wants you to have an opinion. But if your opinion is made up to the point where it won't change, you won't get revelation because he cannot give you something new if you're so stubborn that that's all you want to listen to. And that, and that not only, like I said, this class doesn't just help godly relationships hearing him but think about earthly relationships how does that happen have you ever had a time I, I know Jim and Elizabeth have been married for a long time and they've never had one of these moments what <laughs> and Elizabeth threw her husband way under the bus actually no she threw him under an 18 wheeler and all 18 wheels just rolled over him all right uh Jim I feel for you I've been there by the way you're welcome um, but you know what, we, we have those times, we get into a conversation and we're so opinionated that we have to be right, that doesn't matter what anybody else says, doesn't even matter what our spouse says. But we got to what? You're with her. <laughs> All right, where's Lloyd, where's Russ, we, where's Leonard, we need you guys here, I need more guys, I'm, I'm kind of, we're kind of, Jim and I are outnumbered tonight, okay, we need some guys here tonight, huh? Not a good feeling. Okay, anybody else got something interesting out of the lesson? Right choices bring more right choices. Isn't that, isn't that, isn't that great? You ever heard the this, this, this saying, two wrongs make a right? That's absolutely wrong. <clears throat> two wrongs make another wrong, usually, okay? When they do make a right, it's because of pure accident, Okay? Huh? Pure luck. Or God just blessing your stupidity. And sometimes God does that. I have been there where God has blessed my stupidness. Okay? I don't know if stupidness is a word. I've been, the last few weeks I've just been creating words. I'm creating my own dictionary. All right. Anybody else? Susie, thanks for volunteering. Oh, th thanks for saying you're welcome. Oh, that, that, was, that was right at the end. I, I can rewind at the end. I did it right. Yeah, all these things. But everything reaps something else. That's why you go back to Philippians 4, 6 through 9. If you live Philippians 4, 6 through 9, not Ephesians 4, 6 through 9. Though it's not a bad verse either. If you're just coming in late on, online, I read the wrong verse at the beginning of the service. Uh, but, uh, but, you know, if you live that way, you live with the right thoughts, right thoughts will, will be reaped. Right things will happen in your life. Oh, but something bad's happening. That's okay. But God says all things come together for good for those who are what? Called according to his purpose. You've got to be talking according to his purpose, not your purpose for things that work out good. So many Christians just stop at all things work together for good and forget the rest of the verse. All right, I'll go on here. As I'm not there, I'm there not going to ask my wife to say anything. Okay, so here we go. All right. He's small. I'm so cool. Thanks, Jim. A um, couple of cool things. You know what, uh, here, he talked about earlier, you know, so many people say they just know God, or they know, and, and tell people, you got to know God, you got to know peace, you got to know Jesus, but you know what, they don't know what? The how, show them what? How to do that. Kind of this morning with the Navy SEALs, we got to curl up to them, we, we got to show them the how in, in Christianity. Um, 
I, I like when he says down here, a stronghold. That's, he talked about strongholds tonight. It's a system or way of thinking what? Rooted in a, and not just a lie, but a lie we have come to accept as truth. You know, you say something long enough, it becomes true in your mind. doesn't mean it's true. A lot of people, remember, uh, what is truth? Anybody know what truth is? Two, two truths. Ready? Well, there's God. He is truth, right? And then there is, what do we call truth? Anybody know what humans call truth? Apart from God? Whatever we think is true. Perce- truth is in the eye of the beholder. Truth, perception is what reality is. You know, uh, anybody ever watch Star Wars? All right, watch, well, there's this scene in the, in the, in the, the third one, uh, Return of the Jedi, where Obi-Wan Kenobi's talking to Luke, and Luke finds out in the movie before that, that Darth Vader's my father. Well, everybody knows that scene, right? And, 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 but you told me Darth Vader killed my father. And Obi-Wan goes this. You'll find that most of the things you believe come from a certain point of view. And see, the problem is, <clears throat> order us to see truth as truth, what Jesus has, we need to see from whose point of view? God's. And, that's the, and that means us taking our opinions back. That means us taking our opinions and trying to hear him so we can know what the truth is, so we can see, because when we listen, he can explain what he's seeing so we can see like he sees. Without God, every human being perceives truth on one, on one level. How does whatever happen protect me? You know, it's, it's all meistic. It's, you know, I, I, this is what's true to me because this is what's best for me. God wants to do what's best for you, but what? He's looking out for what? Us. He wants us to look out for others the same. He wants to do it. And when you do that, you start to see what truth is because when you start looking out at others, what do you start to see? You get to see the bigger picture. You see, see, we, see, God sees the whole big picture. He sees all of us at one time. He lives with all of us at one time. And he knows everything that's going on. So he sees the big picture. When we learn to look to others first and listen first and do that first, you know what we're doing? We're starting to expand our picture. You see, when we don't do that, the picture stops right about here, six inches in front of our face. And, and that's the key to good communication, is to be able to look beyond what you can see right in front of your face, or what you can feel right inside of your body. Because you never, cause, cause here, here's, what, here's what kills people. Well, I know exactly how they feel. No, you don't. You'll never know what someone else feels. You'll think you do. And when you do that, and you do that enough, you'll get, you'll get burned by it. I can't tell you how many times I've gone and I, I've assumed what she's thought, thought about something. Pointing to my wife, not looking at her. That has not always gone well. Sometimes I'm right on the button. And then we have times where we're sitting there and she, I'll do something she says, I knew you were going to do that. I'm like, she, she says, I know you. I'm like, how do you know everything I'm going to do? But that's the idea, listening. She, she, she listens well. Me, I talk a lot, so we, we go together well. But it's interesting. But he goes on there. Um, now, strongholds, we want to get them out of our lives. And he says, we need to not just pull them down. We need to what? Demolish them. I think, I think that's part of the problem with a lot of people's lives. They come to God, and, they have a, and strongholds keep us from coming to God because we come with this preconceived conception. Now, strongholds are not always like these horrible things like alcohol or lying. Or, it could be something just our pigheadedness that all humans have. But we come to God with these the strongholds that keep us from hearing God because we're the ones that built the stronghold around us. And God says, you want to hear me? You have to demolish the stronghold. But here's what we normally do. Oh, God, please take whatever is around me. Just, just take it away. What's the problem with that prayer? Huh? We're not doing our part. Because you know what? God's not going to take the stronghold away. God wants you to what? Demolish it. Now, he'll help you. He'll give you the tools to do so. But who's going to demolish it? God says we need to. The violent take it by force. Like I said in the thing, he's not talking about guns and stuff like that. He's saying get rid of the things that are keeping you from being all that God wants you to be. Having all the gifts. 
that God wants you to have. Having all those things, what, what, what keeps you from it? It's the strongholds we build. He says, we need, and, and why do say demolish them? Because if we leave any piece of it back, we'll go right back to it and build upon it again. So we have to demolish them. Now, I had another neat quote in there that goes along with that. Um, you know, he's talking about power. You know, mo- you know and that, that's a big problem in Christianity, especially in Pentecostal circles. Everybody's looking out for more power. I want the power of God in my life. What do you say we really should look for? Authority. Authority is better than power. Why, why is authority better than power? Authority... All I do is speak. Okay, that, that's, that, that, that's kind of there, but not, not yet. Okay. Who has the power? God does. And the power works what? Through us. I mean, people can, do, can pray for people, miracles happen. Is, are you the one that causes the miracle? It's God working through you, Right? Okay, so power is, if you want power, you never know if you're actually, is it actually going to work? Is there going to be a little bit of doubt behind that? That's why you don't see the miracles like you want. The disciples didn't, didn't care about the power, they cared about the authority. Because you have authority, you know what that you know that God's there. See, when you speak in authority, authority, mean, when you, authority simply means this. I am 100% confident in what I'm about to do then God backs you up with the power. But what's people want? I, I want the power. I want this gift. I want that gift. I want to be able to go this and do this. God says, if you have all authority, you can do what? All things. Philippians, what, 4.13. I can do all things through Christ who thins me. Or we can reverse that. I, we can do all things, that's authority, knowing I have to do to do it, through Christ who gives me the power, strength. Now, that, that, and that, that's a, and, and you know, unfortunately, in Christianity, we get, the, we get those two terms backwards. God will always back you up if you're confident. But if you're not confident, he's not going to back you up because he, th- th- then you're not really trusting in him. You're also, because the reason why you're not confident is because you have a little bit of, con- you're, you're, you're trusting yourself or you're actually doubting can God do what he's going to do. So there's a big difference between the word authority well, not di- di- it is different between the word authority and power, but in our mind, we've got to realize that getting a, our confident level up will bring the power along with it. Now, does that mean we've got to be 100% confident all the time? No, well, we're humans. God knows that. It's a, it's a process. He wants us to progress. Okay, he wants us to go through that. But the more confident we get, the more we'll see God back us up. See, the problem is people want to go out and do the power And they don't see it happening, and so God must not be there. What's it say? Power corrupts what? Absolutely, doesn't it? You know, I believe sometimes there's there's good people out there that move through God, God moves through, and I believe there's good people out there that think God moves through, but it's really the devil. Because if someone gets on a power trip, they'll think they're all that. And then here's the deal. When the the cord gets pulled, whether God pulls the plug or the devil pulls the plug, depending on where they've gone to in their life, and that happens, then, then what do they try to do? They try to manufacture things in order to keep their power because they got to have it. It's like a drug. But what's authority? But in order to have authority, what has to go with authority? Huh? Well, power comes. Yeah, God will bless that. But what do you got to have to have authority? Faith. What else? Authority. Now, when we think of authority on earth, we think of someone who's in command. When we think godly authority, we think of, God says what? I will, what? Lift up the humble. You know what? A humbleness, knowing where you stand. I am with the almighty God who could think me out of existence, who could do anything he wants to do, but he is my best friend. And because of that, and he said, I can do all these things the Bible says I can do. I have authority in this situation, but not because I'm somebody great, because I'm with the guy who's great. So that, 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 that's the thing. And then sometimes people take authority the other way. Oh, and I, it, like in the Bible, you see all these people go out and try to do things. I, 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 in the name of Jesus. And it's like, wait a second. But if Jesus ain't, it, it's, but then when they, you can tell by how they say it. You know, the cast, do you got to get in the demon's face and go, in the name of Jesus, be gone. No, you can just say, actually, I think it'd be even better to say, oh, the devil, I'm with Jesus. Get out of here. 
That's real authority. Because you've got to scream or you've got to prove it. That's really not authority, is it? Because if you know that you know, it should be calm. It should be peaceful. It should be noble. All those things from Philippians, from Philippians chapter 4. That's how you should act. Because you know what? I have authority. I can rest. And that's what I remember from last week. There's a rest for the people. I can, the storm's going on, but I am just fine. That's authority. When you have to try to claim the authority, because some people go out there and they, they try to claim all kinds of different things. There's nothing wrong with saying, God, you said. There's nothing wrong with saying, God, I need this or I want this. But we give God the opportunity to do that and he talks to us. But here's the deal. When we start to go beyond our authority into, well, I'm God, you follow me. That's when it doesn't work. That's right. But a lot of people have been sucked into that little trap in Christianity and realizing God lifts up, he only lifts up the humble. He does not lift up the proud. Actually, all all the verses on pride are bad. (laughs) Now, you can be proud of God, you can be proud of your relationship, but when you take it to that next level, it's bad. There's a fine line. But authority, you don't have to yell and scream. I've been, I, I, I don't go to many conferences for that main reason. You go to these conferences, you get these people yelling and screaming and doing all, you know, that's great. Well, it's not great. I think it's horrible. I, my, that's just my personal opinion. I've never been a big person to go to those things because you get these people, they'll put their hand on the head like this. <laughs> you ever been to one of those? I mean, I just, it just, you ever seen them on TV and then, and then, and then, and then and you start yelling at them and doing this and doing that? And, you know, if you really have authority, you should be able to talk in a normal voice and watch the devil run. Look at all the scriptures when the devils ran from Jesus, when the demons ran from Jesus. Did Jesus ever yell at them? He just walked up, oh, okay, you want to go on the pigs? Go. You know, he says, greater, we will do the same things and greater things than he did if we have him inside of us. So why do we got to scream and look like crazy people? I think the best authority is just to say, hey, get out of my life. And then when Jesus pushes that demon out or, put, or heals that person around you or does something around you, then you see real power because you're not trying to add anything to it. That's when God can move. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yep. The peace of God that passes all sending you around you. That Philippians four. That makes your life so much better. We just now. What would it be moments of time we want to yell and scream and do all that stuff? Yeah, we do. We're, we're humans. We can vent to God. But when we're actually out there in the battle, this is how God wants us to react. And we do that. We're also more listen to whatever He says to do. Because you know what, most miracles in the Bible, they're, 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 uh, especially in the Old Testament, they asked the people of God to do some crazy things. <clears throat> the only reason they were able to do the crazy things because they, they, they were confident in their God. And because they were confident and not getting overly excited, they were able to hear exactly what God wanted to do. Look at the battle of Jericho. Look at the, all these other battles. I mean, they're all crazy things. Look at Elijah on top of Mount Carmel and all these different things that happened. It wasn't because they got all the emotionally crazed and nuts. Actually, you look in the Bible, the opponents were the ones who were emotionally crazed and nuts. God rewards a humble, in control. What's God saying in, in 1 Corinthians? God is not a God of chaos, but a God of order. And it's in 1 Corinthians chapter 14 about rules for how a church is supposed to be. And those rules are how a church is supposed to be. You know, you're only supposed to have so many uh, words, of, words in the service. Because so like what, God doesn't want it to go into this point where you get puffed up. All right, uh, what time is it? Ooh, 7 o'clock. All right, uh, I, I don't know, do I have anything else I thought was really interesting? You guys got that one. Yep, you got that one. Uh, that's everything. I, that's that's the big things I got out of the night. Anybody else got something else they were inter- thought was interesting from tonight? I thought it was a very interesting lesson hearing what he has to say about that. So, all right. Well, let's pray, and then uh, we'll be back again next Sunday night for 
our next to last class. And we are, it's a long lesson. It's going to be, it's about 20, it's 40 some minutes for the next lesson. So we're going to break into two 20 minute parts. So we'll have a little bit less time for discussion at the end. Um, but uh, but the, I like to, not that I want the class to end, but I want to, I have other things we, want, we can talk about. Uh, and uh, next week we'll, uh, hopefully things are getting back to normal, getting a few more people out, which is great. We will talk about, I will have some different options for what class we can do next. Okay? Uh, and I will take your opinion. It's not a voting thing. I just want to kind of see what, you know, does the thing. It's, it, you know, at the end of the day, I'm the one that has to stand up here and talk about it. So, all right. So, dear Lord, we thank you for tonight. We thank you for allowing us to have this class. We can learn how to hear your voice. Help us, Lord, Lord tonight to learn the difference between authority and power and the different, and how to just let our, our inner soul be, be calmed, our spirit to be calmed, to hear from you so we can know exactly what is your voice and what is not your voice. So we're not confused. Because, Lord, as we hear your voice, we'll, we'll know it and we'll be able to do amazing things with you. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. All right, well, have a great night.